Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast, where we talk about everything dog. Q and A's with veterinarian professionals, rescue operators, everyday topics. We cover everything dog on this podcast. So make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform, and make sure you're following us on social media on both Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for listening. Now here's that next episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast. This is your host, Brittany, and we are joined today by Jen from Bosley's Place. It is a rescue located outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Jen's going to tell us all about it. Um, So thank you for joining us, Jen. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about you and what you do, and then let's we'll move into the the rescue. Okay. Well, um, I, I actually everything I do now is the rescue. <laughs> so uh, my my background actually was business, and starting this rescue, it's been almost ten years ago now, was was basically a fluke. Um, but I ended up learning that I have a skill set that um, is really needed in the animal welfare community, so I stuck with it. And you focus a lot on puppies and not even puppies. You focus on baby puppies. So tell us a little bit about how, how did that happen? How did you kind of find that niche? Sure. So you are absolutely correct. Bosley's Place is exclusively for neonatal orphaned puppies. So we don't take in families. We just take in the little boos that need somebody to care for them. Um, Bosley's Place started, I mentioned, almost 10 years ago. Bosley turns 10 in September. And I, uh, it was a fluke. Honestly, I found a dog on my way home from the dog park with my puppy, Reuben. And Animal Control wasn't available to come get it. They're like, you can tie it to a tree for four hours. And I was like, eh, I think I'll come bring him in. So right. big mistake. Well, I don't know. Right place, wrong time. Wrong place, right time. While I was um, at the shelter, somebody walked in with Bosley. He was a two-week-old little puppy. Uh, He was found in a trash can in um, a city park. And the shelter at the time was not a no-kill shelter. And they were trying desperately to find resources to keep him alive. And they were not successful. And they were about to euthanize. And I said, hey, what do you need to save this little thing's life? Because, of course, somebody put him in my hands and I was already in love. Mm -hmm. So they said, we need somebody who's going to be able to bottle feed him. And I said that, you know, we need a foster. I'm like, well, how do I become a foster? And they're like, you just did. And they handed (laughs) me Bosley and a baby bottle. And I'm like, "Uh, what goes in this thing? (laughs) And they were trying try goat's milk. So um, honestly, they didn't even really know how to care for newborns either. So it was, um, it was a blessing. It was, it was a true blessing. And shortly after um, Bosley was ready, you know, he was healthy and ready to be adopted. And I asked if I could see the adoption applications that they had for him. And I went in and I was like, eh, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Nobody's good enough. So yeah. Bosley said, me. And um, just about a week later, they called me about another litter of puppies they found. They thought their mom was a stray. Um, there was then like almost immediately after that, there was a litter of six. Their oh, wow. mother was dying. She had an upper respiratory infection. So I took in those six. And then, I, you know, after a while, the, the beginning of the year, because Bosley happened in September. So by December, and I was raising all these newborns, I was like, what, how often, you know, how often does this happen? And at the time I was transitioning my career as well. So it just happened to be very fortuitous. And I decided um, about January of that year that I was going to become a licensed rescue and do this exclusive focus. And I can't tell you that every person I'd met in animal welfare or rescues were like, don't do it. Don't do it. This is going to be so sad. Orphan newborns had a 15% chance of survival. Mm-hmm. And they just felt like rescue was hard enough that, uh, you know, with these grim rates of success, that it would be just depressing. And uh, we have an 87% survival rate, which oh, is- Oh, wow. That's amazing. It's because it's the only thing we do. Honestly, if I was taking in, you know, more medical cases, I do take the occasional medical case, but if I did it a lot, or I took in seniors, or I took in you know, anybody that was on death row, I wouldn't know what I know. It's, mm-hmm. it's truly because it's been our exclusive focus for 10 years that 
we're, we're just able to work miracles now, which is incredible. Yeah. So how are you finding a lot of these puppies? Is it shelters calling you? Is it, you know, just people on the street who are like, Hey, I found a puppy in a ditch or, <laughs> you know, how are you finding most of the puppies? That's a great question. So here in Georgia, we have laws that um, actually prevent me from taking in um, some puppies. So when I first started, every puppy uh, really came from that one shelter and they kept me fully stocked yeah. always. And then others started hearing about us and more shelters were calling. So our, I would say our first couple of years was 90% um, from shelters, um, either moms rejecting or puppies that were found tied up in a bag on the side of the road or, you know, tossed out of a car, just, you know, people suck. So, um, that, and then the word got out and we started hearing from some breeders who, um, and I'll be honest, there's not a lot of rescues that like to work with breeders because if you think about it, we're, we're polar opposites. These are right. people who are bringing puppies into the world all the time for profit. And we are rescues who are 100% volunteers. We are killing ourselves to, to make money for donations, you know, so there's, you know, not a lot of synergy there. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, I have been able to teach a lot of breeders neonatal critical care. So uh -huh. there was a time when, you know, and, the, and I, I've learned one other thing since starting the rescue and no knock to any veterinarian because I think they're all incredible. They don't teach neonatal critical care in vet school. It's just mm -hmm. not a class. You could take classes about, um, I pregnant moms and um, nursing, you know, breeding. You could, you could take classes on how to breed, but right. uh, mom is to take care of the puppies, you know, for the first eight weeks of their life. And um, it's just not taught as a class. And I wish it was, honestly, if mm -hmm. more people think we'd be able to save a whole lot more. Um, so with the breeders started calling and, um, you know, a mom would reject or there'd be a cleft palate or, you know, there's so many reasons why, why puppies need intervention, um, but we're able to provide it. And, uh, you know, right now in the rescue, I have a pup, an Aussie doodle from a breeder. I have three Cavapoos from another breeder. Um, I've got a whole ton of mutts from local <laughs> shelters. Um, we, you know, other than the breeders, we don't do a lot of owner surrenders because, you know, the, it's, it's a specialty that we do, you know, not everybody's looking to give away newborn puppies. If they're right. breeding their dog, it's usually because they're looking to make money off of them. And most vets um, will advise with a non-thriving puppy to just let nature take its course. Um, mm -hmm. which is bad, you know, it's just because they just yeah. don't know. Some of them right. just need to be fed for 24, 48 hours until they have enough strength to start nursing. So, um, you know, everyone that comes through the doors, we, we throw the kitchen sink at them and, um, and works 87% of the time. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so you guys do have like a, kind of like a nursery setup, right? You have like a, a little facility for the puppies. So we do have a facility. Um, it's actually almost like a little campus. It's two buildings. We have a vetting office. Um, the other building is more like our adoption office. We've got a photo shoot area. There is a place where the puppies can be safely, but we don't house. And then there's a whole dog park, which is like puppy paradise. Mm -hmm. And we're only on Sundays. Um, all of our puppies are in foster homes. So in my personal home, I have two ICUs and a little puppy nursery. So most of the critical ones will come to me. I also have a few vet techs. Um, that are able to, we have two other ICUs out there that are kind of like satellite ICUs. If I'm full, I'll send um, to them. Actually, one of my vet techs specializes in a deformity called hydrocephalus. And I just moved a puppy to her because another breeder, a Boston Terrier that came from a breeder. And um, he not only has a cleft palate, but he also has hydrocephalus, which is fluid on the brain. Oh, so, wow. That's the other thing about the breeders. I would prefer to teach them how to care for their own because most often when there's a congenital defect like a cleft palate, which is obvious when it's born, it's not able to latch to its mom's nipple. Um, there's usually another one that we can't yeah. see yet. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, it, exactly. It, whether it's internal or external, you know, with the fluid on the brain, their head swells. Um, 
So, and, and you know, the, that puppy will be fine. We'll get it on medications. It's four weeks old now. So we started it on one medication. It's a little too young for steroids, but, you know, hopefully we caught it in time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, which brings another thing to mind that there's a lot of other dogs that could be born with these conditions like hydrocephalus. Um, and if they're not born in a place that specializes in neonates, they're not going to recognize it as quickly. Mm -hmm. So they'll go untreated for longer. So um, there's been a lot of benefits to doing this rescue. I hate to say it to everybody who told me not to start this rescue, but the truth is these weren't intended bonuses, but a bottle fed baby is so easy to train. Like 90% of my adopters were like, Hey, you said this puppy wasn't potty trained, but he's never gone in house. And they, they don't know mommy was a dog. Mommy was a right. human. Right. So they really, really listen and they're super affectionate and they know nothing but trust, love and respect. And so we really do make the best puppies. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> throw that out there. But it was it was unintended. It was just a bonus on the side. And the other thing is is medical conditions. We're able to identify them earlier, start treatment earlier. Um, tonight we're taking in um, an English cream golden retriever puppy who is four weeks old, and um, she she came from a breeder. She was born a swimmer puppy. So her uh, swimmer puppies when they're born with their legs straight out, they can't mm -hmm. stand. They're laying on their chest. It's completely flat on the ground. And if it's not treated, if they don't start physical therapy immediately, we, we tape their legs together, um, usually maybe with a pool noodle in there. You know, we, we want to make sure that they can't lay flat. We we line their habitat with like egg crate foam, you know, mm -hmm. that egg. Um, you know, we and we put a lot of stuffed animals in there. So there's no flat surface, right? So if we could, we catch that super early, we could start that at one day old. This oh, puppy's wow. us at four weeks old because there was another rescue lined up for it. Um, but it's in New York and the puppy's here in Georgia. And when it went to go to the vet, uh, the vet said that the lungs are already compressed because mm -hmm. the ribs are flat. So it wouldn't be safe for the, um, the altitude for the yeah. puppy to fly. So um, we're taking that one in tonight, but um, you know, it's so, so the benefits to working with these young, young, young puppies is seeing their medical conditions really early, um, raising the sweetest, best, most obedient little love bugs. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's rewarding. It's rewarding. You know, I, I don't have human children and mm -hmm. um, I've got 2000 puppies at this point. And <laughs> they're like my babies. I love yeah. every how many puppies do you have right now? Um, actually, I just cleared out my nursery because I'm going on vacation. Um, but normally I'll, I had two litters here yesterday. So, um, okay. but within the rescue between 30 and 40 puppies, oh, wow. um, we're, you know, hundred percent foster based. So um, they're out there in, in foster homes. And that's actually, I would say one of our greatest needs. Um, you know, a lot of people, I don't, I feel like some people don't come to us for fostering because they're like, oh, they're newborns. I don't know how to bottle feed. I can't be up yeah. for two hours. But the truth is they all grow and get healthy and we need to move them out of our nurseries into, you know, foster homes that think puppies are cute and don't have a problem picking up poop. <laughs> yeah. So if someone wants to become a foster, uh, what kind of requirements do you guys have for that? So um, our foster and our adoption requirements are kind of the same. So um, we have a small area, you know, you have to be pretty much within 30 to 45 minutes of our nursery in Smyrna, Georgia, which is basically Atlanta. We're just over the city line. Um, uh, space, space <laughs> in your home uh, and space in your heart because um, it's a commitment. You know, puppies are, I guess, like little children mm -hmm. and, you know, they need, they need care and it is a commitment and um, it's not always easy. It's definitely always cute, but it's not always easy. You know, you wake right. up and you're like, ah, what did you do? Yeah. It's like a fast two rolls in it, you know, and then everybody needs a bath. So it's work. But, um, but the truth is that like, if we don't have foster homes that we can move them out of the nurseries, we save so many less puppies with foster homes. We're just able to save so many more mm -hmm. and the experiences, you know, when, when they're in a foster home, they get to meet kids and cats and other dogs. And, you know, they get to go out to the market when they're old enough that they, they get a real life, you know, they live in a right. home. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think some people forget, like, you know, some people are like, well, I, I can't adopt, I can't commit, but I think fostering is a really good way of giving back and helping. Maybe you can only foster for three months or two months or whatever it might be. And so I think that's a huge way that people can help, even if they're not ready to commit to an adoption yet. Absolutely. Or even volunteer on Sundays at our, at our adoption events. I mean, and, and the truth is, you know, I'm actually not selfish. I'm not going to pitch just for Bosley's place. I can't think of a rescue that is not hurting for yeah. resources. You know, whether it's donating a couple dollars or, you know, if you have a rich uncle, a lot of money. Um, but you know, giving even like shelters, even an hour of, of a week, yeah. you know, a dog out for a walk, that may be the only time that dog gets out of its pen, you know. Um, but, 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 you know, and, and you could volunteer for a couple of hours on a weekend at an adoption event or, you know, volunteer to clean up some kennels for another rescue or transport, you know. Right. So, well, we need to move puppies. We need to get puppies to the vet and back to their foster home. Uh, we call them puppy taxis. So <laughs> there's so many ways to contribute, not just to Bosley's place, but to really any rescue that, that you might be local to. I'm sure your listeners aren't all here. You're not here. You're in Florida. Right. <laughs> so, and, and Florida too. South Florida is always, always urgent. You know, yeah. I'm part of so many rescue groups on social media South Florida is always as urgent as, as Atlanta is, um, mm -hmm. ways. And, you know, I think that, um, fostering that like you said is a great way to determine, even if you're ready to adopt, you know, like right. something that you've been thinking about, but you're just not sure the smartest thing to do would be try one out short term, you know? Yeah. Um, of course we, we always like to have fosters commit till adopted, but we also have fosters that who do that. They have a vacation and mm -hmm. they need coverage for a weekend or need coverage for a week so that they can make that three month commitment. Um, right. so short term fosters are needed. I mean, yeah. it, we're, we're so desperate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never tell us, grab a bag. <laughs> tell us about the adoption events. So, how often and where do you guys have those at? So, sure. We, um, like I mentioned, we have a little campus here in Smyrna. So every Sunday we have our adoption events and it's really by appointment only that started during COVID and actually worked out so well for us because um, we really, really like to invite people on property that are super serious and have put mm -hmm. a lot of thought into adoption. We're not about, you know, tire kickers and window shoppers and people who want to come for puppy parties, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, we do puppy parties, but that's how we raise money for the, for the, for the rescue. Um, but we do our, have adoption events. They're every Sunday from 11 to three and they're by appointment to get an appointment. You have to complete an application. Um, so, and then all of our puppies that have adoption appointments, they're at our facility over the summer. Um, if they don't have a family that's interested in them, we have a little pop-up at, um, in the Smyrna market village. Here, mm -hmm. It's local. Just down the street from our facility, um, just outside of Stout Brothers. Um, that's a little beer market in the Smyrna Square. They have their farmers market every Sunday, and we're there from eleven to two. So if anybody does want to come, just see cute puppies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where go. Okay. And then um, last question here is: Where can people find you as far as your website? Uh, are you on social media? Plug all of those so people can find the puppies. Thank you for asking. So we do have a website, but the truth is that I probably don't keep it up to date as best <laughs> I could. Um, it's so we, social media. I mean, we're on Facebook, Bosley's Place Inc. Um, we're on Instagram at Bosley's Place. And we're also on TikTok. TikTok, our TikTok channel is definitely a must because um, that's where our social media volunteers get really silly and yeah. cute adorable and like just the cutest videos really really cute um uh so we're on all of social media and uh i mean we post puppies probably six times a day so mm -hmm. if you want to get your puppy fixed come see us yeah and if anyone's listening you guys will know i share the some of the puppies like kind of on instagram on my story so if you see puppies you know where they're at they're in georgia go get them go foster them um, and thank you, Jen, for the hard work that you do. I know it is a lot of work. It is more work than anyone will ever know or understand, but it is appreciated by everyone in the animal community. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. I, I love it. Thank Christina for introducing us. 
Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, good luck to your your, your babies. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Canine Culture Podcast. Please make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform and make sure you're following us on social media. If you have any recommendations, any topics that you'd like to hear, if you know of any guests that would be good for the show, or if you yourself want to be a guest, please reach out to us. Send us an email at canineculturepodcast at gmail.com or send us a direct message on social media. Thank you for listening and please share this with any of your dog loving friends.